How's everybody doing? Good. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen this many people stopped into this room in quite a while. But, uh, must be everyone's here to see John. So uh, uh, I said earlier that we don't ever have to try very hard to uh, advertise these programs when John's involved because. Uh, Everybody knows him. Um, since everybody knows him, I'm not going to say too much. Uh, John, I uh, see he does have his uh, uh, wonderful blog address. Um, it's also a fun follow on Twitter, so if you're into that. Um, but uh, wonderful, wonderfully researched um, stories about revolutionary Boston on, on the blog. So definitely check that out. Um, John is also the uh, uh, works with the friends of Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters. Um, so he's a, a wonderful friend of the site. And a couple of years, a few years ago now, produced uh, 600 and some odd pages on the nine, slightly less than nine months that George Washington was here. So uh, he still has a little bit of material. Uh, also, uh, last. Last year, year before now, that uh, Road to Concord came. Uh, year before. Year before. So, um, if you haven't read Road to Concord yet, John's uh, book about uh, cannon leading up to um, start kicking off the revolution, it's definitely worth checking out as well. Um, and welcome to all, or all of you that, uh, if, if some of you haven't been to the site before, I do see some new faces. Um, if you're interested in getting directly into your email inbox a listing of all of our future events, we, on the way out we have on the clipboard there uh, our email newsletter uh, mailing list you can sign up for and get those things sent directly to you. But um, I'm going to get out of the way and let John start talking. All right. So, welcome, John. Uh, supervisory park ranger here and to all the Longfellow Washington staff who have helped out uh, to the friends of uh, Longfellow House Washington's headquarters who are represented here uh, and to the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati that's been very generous in supporting my research and also the organization Revolution 250 which is uh, a coalition of nonprofit groups historic sites museums libraries and so on that is uh, celebrating the Sester Centennial, that's the 250th anniversary of events leading up to the American Revolution here in Massachusetts. So watch for more of those. My starting point tonight, talking about the myths and realities of Colonel Henry Knox's first mission, is a quotation from the diary of this man, John Adams. On January 24th, 1776, he was here on Brattle Street. He ate his midday dinner at a house uh, being used by Quartermaster General Thomas Mifflin, which is now uh, owned by the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. And Mifflin, that uh, day, he hosted General George Washington, he hosted John Adams, and he hosted a delegation of leaders from the Caughnawaga Mohawk community near Montreal. So it was quite an interesting dinner, which I'll have to talk about maybe another year. The next day, John Adams set out for Philadelphia to resume meeting with the Continental Congress, and in his diary he wrote, about 10, Mr. Gary, that's Elbridge Gary, another delegate to the Congress, called me and we rode to Framingham where we dined. And after dinner, a wealthy local <coughs> farmer showed Adams and Gary the train of artillery brought down from Ticonderoga by Colonel Knox. And Adams went on to list exactly what was in that train of artillery. It consists of iron, nine 18 pounders now uh, and that was how pound, uh, cannon were designated in the 18th century an 18 pounder cannon was capable of uh, shooting a cannonball that weighed 18 pounds the average an, an average size cannon was probably a six pounder uh, so an 18 pounder could do a lot of damage smaller than that uh, smaller than six they could be maneuvered very nicely but they didn't have a lot of power Larger, they were very heavy and bulky, but they were useful for siege uh, warfare, which is what General Washington was up to. And of course, the Continental Army was besieging Boston. Now, so back to John Adams' diary, it consists of iron, nine 18-pounders, 10 12s, six six, four nine-pounders, then three iron mortars, two 10-inch mortars, one eight-inch, and one six and a half. Howitz, one eight inch and a half and one eight. 
Uh, mortars were designed to fire explosive shells, iron spears full of gunpowder that would uh, be lit as, from the firing, and the fuse would burn down. They would hopefully explode at the right moment in their, uh, in their flight to cause damage to the other side. Uh, and a howitzer was a particular type of mortar. And then Adams got to the brass guns. Pound for pound, brass was, more, was stronger than iron for a cannon. And when brass guns burst, which was an occupational hazard for artillerists, they didn't blow up in shrapnel the way an iron, a cast iron cannon do. It would usually just burst one little area of the brass tube, so fewer people were killed. Uh, brass cannon, eight three-pounders, one four-pounder, two six-pounders, one 18-pounder, and one 24-pounder. One eight inch and a half mortar, one seven and a half inch ditto, and five cohorns. Cohorns were yet another type of mortar, smaller and easy to carry around. In all in all, John Adams counted 58 pieces of artillery in Framingham on January 26th. And this stuff in Framingham, as commemorated by this local marker, is an important moment, a, a, a scene from this very popular story of the Revolutionary War of Henry Knox bringing the cannon to uh, the siege lines. Here are some examples of books retelling Henry Knox's story for different audiences. Uh, and down on the uh, lower right is a view from a viewmaster set. <laughs> and you may very well, in fact, have heard this story of Henry Knox and the cannon. How George, General George Washington sent the young bookseller Henry Knox out to Fort Ticonderoga to bring that cannon and how the Knox struggled over wintry mountains with ox teams loaded with the heavy guns. And as Washington planned, that artillery forced the British Army out of Boston in March 1776. So, there we go. All done. <laughs> as usual, the historical story is a lot more complicated. Not that what I said before is necessarily wrong. But it is a simplification of a very complex story, which, and I'm going to talk about the complications, the secrets, the arguments, the mysteries tonight, the size of the story that we don't usually hear about. Starting with the idea that a lot of people say that Americans had no cannon when the war began. In 1871, Horatio Bateman's biography of 250 distinguished national men said this about Henry Knox. When young Knox presented himself at Washington's headquarters, our army was destitute of cannon. And the belief that the American army had no artillery pops up a lot. But in fact, the Massachusetts Patriots had started to collect cannon in September 1774, seven months before the war began. And this is what I wrote about in this book, uh, The Road to Concord. Whoops. Let's see. Uh, they, uh, the Patriots were hauling cannon out of batteries that guarded the shores of Charlestown and Salem. They brought, bought cannon from merchants who had armed their ships in the last war. They even stole four small brass cannon out of armories in Boston, smuggled them out, and all the way out to Concord. And those stories are all in this book. For now, I'll just say that in April 1775, James Warren wrote to his wife, Mercy, from Concord, this town is full of cannon. <laughs> Warren expected that the British commander, General Thomas Gage, wanted those guns. And indeed, General Gage had spies out in the countryside, even in Concord, looking for those guns. When Gage ordered his troops out to march out to, march out to Concord in, on April 19, 1775, he was hoping that they would capture and destroy the Patriots' cannon. So the Massachusetts Patriots actually had, not only had a cannon, they had enough cannon to spark a war. Which is not to say that those cannon were all big, or in good condition, or fully equipped. In fact, that was a big sticking point for the American army. Over the course of 1775, uh, the New England army gained some more artillery. A company of artillery from New Rhode Island came up with four excellent field pieces, according to the newspapers. And in late May, the provincials captured at least two small cannon off a British Navy ship that ran aground near Chelsea. And in November, this man, Captain John Manley, captured a British supply ship that was carrying, among other things, a mortar that was 13 inches across. And that was such a big mouth that the Army just had to nickname it the Congress. <laughs> 
Now, of course, all those new artillery pieces, they were balanced down a little bit by the provincials losing five four-pounders to the British during the Battle of Bunker Hill. So the, uh, but all in all, we have to remember the Continental Army did have artillery, and it even had large <laughs> artillery. Here's an entry from the journal of Private Samuel Bixby, stationed in Roxbury, July 1st, 1775, Saturday. We are making it strong as possible around the fort. We have two 24-pounder cannon and 40 balls to each. We finished one platform and placed the cannon on it just at night and then fired two balls into Boston. And General William Heath recorded those same two shots from a 24-pounder in his diary. Uh, later in his diary, Private Bixby mentioned our 18-pounder. So these, they had some big siege guns. They just didn't have a whole lot. Uh, we also have a report from General Colonel Richard Gridley, commander of the Continental Artillery. Uh, uh, he had been hired by the Massachusetts Provincial Congress on the very second day of the war. Uh, he was a very highly respected man. On October 20th, after much prodding, he finally submitted an inventory to General Washington that listed all the ordnance, shot, and shells now in camp. And his list included five 24-pounders, six 18-pounders, two 12-pounders, <coughs> Three nine pounders, one eight pounder, two six pounders, four five and a quarter pounders, seven four pounders, nine three pounders, and two two and a half pounders. Forty one cannon in all, plus nearly nine thousand cannonballs, ten mortars, and over a thousand mortar shells. So again, while Henry Knox's trip up to Lake Champlain certainly added to the Continental Army's artillery, we shouldn't think that they, they, he brought back the very first cannon that the Americans had. Another commonly uh, repeated myth about his mission was that he had the idea. Many biographers uh, credit Knox with the idea of bringing cannon down from Lake Champlain. Some even say that other people dismissed this idea. They made fun of it. They called it, according to one uh, Tolan's book, Knox's folly. In fact, many people had that idea all along. Back on May 3rd, the head of the Massachusetts Committee of Safety wrote out orders for an aggressive officer from Connecticut to go west and to try to take Fort Ticonderoga and other British Army sites along Lake Champlain, and those orders specified that the, author, or the officer was to, quote, take possession of the cannon, mortars, stores, and etc. upon the lake, and bring back with you such of the cannon, mortars, stores, etc. as you shall judge may be serviceable to the Army here. <coughs> Now, the head of the Committee of Safety who wrote those orders was Dr. Benjamin Church, Jr., and the, the Connecticut officer was this man, Benedict Arnold. <laughs> and both of those men, Church and Arnold, turned out to be traitors. <laughs> so that may be one reason we don't give them the credit for coming up with the idea of bringing the cannon back from Lake Champlain. But that document does show that the Patriots were thinking about bringing back cannon in the mortars uh, from the very beginning. Nobody just got around to doing those, those that, uh, making that action for two reasons. One, people were very busy with other things. And two, in the fall, the Americans started a plan to invade Canada. And it was thought that perhaps the New Yorkers who were uh, running that plan would want some of those cannons. So you couldn't probably go and take them. On October 23rd, General Washington had a conference here at his headquarters in Cambridge to make plans for the coming month. And one of the agenda items was, artillery of different kinds will be wanted. How is it to be got and where? And the man at the conference, general and delegates from the Continental Congress agreed that what, what can be spared from New York and Crown Point be procured. <coughs> Crown Point was up on Lake Champlain. So Knox's mission to bring back cannon wasn't just a one guy's crazy idea, it was policy, it was the official policy of the Continental Forces. And the question which they then had to fit, talk about in that council was who was the right man to do the job. And that brings us to Henry Knox's life in Boston before the war. What sort of military experience, what especially artillery experience, did Knox have? His first biographer in 1873 stated that he had served in Boston's Militia Artillery Company, which was called The Train. And that's possible because nearly every white man aged 16 to 60 was supposed to train in a militia company, but there are no records putting Knox in the train. 
because there are no records of who was in the trade. They just didn't keep uh, the, that sort of role. Uh, we do know that in the spring of 1772, Knox <coughs> helped to co-found a different militia unit, the Boston Grenadier Corps. Grenadiers were an elite type of infantry, usually chosen from the biggest soldiers available. And the captain was Joseph Pierce, and the first lieutenant was Henry Knox, who was definitely a big man, so he would fit into the Grenadiers. In the New England militia, the men elected their officers up to the level of captain. So the privates would elect the lieutenants and the captains. And when Henry Knox was made a lieutenant in this unit, people signed up to be uh, under him, that showed he was a popular, he was admired. This was also a way of, for him to rise in society, because uh, officers were seen as gentlemen. They were seen as men, uh, as natural leaders, as men to uh, admire. Uh, and uh, for Henry Knox, if this was his uh, you know, route to social success, it worked. Because in 1773, the year after this unit was founded, Knox was, Henry was parading with his militia company in Boston, in his uniform on training day, and a young woman named Lucy Flucker saw him and asked, who was that big handsome man? <laughs> now, Lucy's father was Thomas Flucker, a wealthy and established merchant. Henry Knox was not established in society. He was in a sort of borderline position. He was a bookbinder, so he was still working with his hands. And that meant he was, in the eyes of society, he was a mechanic, not in the middling class. But as a bookseller, he served and had contact with the upper class clientele, because those were the people who were wealthy and educated enough to buy his product. So he could gain manners and education and knowledge and impress them. He had only a few years of schooling, but the books that he had worked on gave him this chance of learning on his own. In the previous generation in Boston, Thomas Hancock had started as a bookseller, and he had become one of the richest merchants in Massachusetts. So Henry Knox could rise into the ranks of gentlemen, but he wasn't there yet. And there was some uh, worry about whether he was good enough for Mr. Flooker's daughter. Furthermore, Thomas Flooker was a supporter of the royal government. <laughs> he was not one of the Whigs protesting the new taxes from London. And in fact, in 1774, uh, there was uh, the lieutenant governor died, so everybody moved up one, and Thomas Flooker became the provincial secretary, the third ranking royal appointee. Which brings us to the question of Henry Knox's politics. Again, if we read biographies of Henry Knox, they talk about him as being an outspoken Whig before the war, somebody who was protesting all these royal taxes, somebody who, a son of liberty, a patriot. But his name doesn't appear on any of the lists of Whig activists at the time. He, was, he didn't dine with the Sons of Liberty in 1769. He didn't sign major petitions. He wasn't active in the town meeting or the political caucuses. Now, it might be that he doesn't show up there because he was still too young. Uh, he didn't turn 21 until 1771, so he might just not have been prominent enough. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, we do know one moment when he was definitely visible and uh, on the scene of a major pre-revolutionary event was at the Boston Massacre. He was there and he actually buttonholed the Captain Thomas Preston as he was going up to the soldiers and reminded the captain that he shouldn't order the, the soldiers to fire. And he uh, gave a testimony about this to a town report. The attorneys prosecuting that captain for the matter called Knox as a witness in court. So he's a prosecution witness. He testified. And his testimony was so helpful to the captain that at the next trial of the soldiers, the defense attorneys called Knox as a witness. <laughs> So it would be pretty easy to perceive Knox in the early 1770s as a neutral, at least, not just looking out for his business, not somebody who was politically active, not an outspoken Whig. And then he went and married the royal secretary's daughter in June 1774. And that was just six months after the Boston Tea Party, three months after the second Boston Tea Party. And incidentally, no witness ever said Knox was at the Tea Party either. Uh, in uh, just one month after his wedding, a New Yorker named James Rivington sent Knox four chests of tea to sell. 
Now, crowds were attacking men in the Massachusetts countryside for selling any tea, even tea which they had found washed up on the shore. Rivington nevertheless thought that Henry Knox would be interested in going into the tea business at this moment. <laughs> and I think Rivington thought that because he knew that Knox had just married into this loyalist family. Who else would be selling tea but a loyalist merchant's son-in-law? In the 18th century, family networks were very important. They were the strongest networks for business. And Thomas Fluker had the power to set up young Henry Knox as a young merchant. Who would turn him down? But Knox wrote back to Rivington saying he couldn't sell any tea in Boston, not openly. And on the other hand, as late as February 6, 1775, Knox reported to Rivington privately, one chest I sold to my particular friend at the rate of 12 shillings sterling per pound, but had not been able to sell one ounce to any other persons. So instead of being a prominent, outspoken winter before the war, Henry Knox seemed to be playing a balancing game. <laughs> Rivington also promised to recommend Knox's bookstore to officers of the 42nd Regiment as they made the move from New York to Boston. The British government had ordered the army back into Boston in the spring of 1774, and then General Gage began bringing in more and more troops. Sources agree uh, that Knox's bookstore became a popular hangout for officers and young ladies. Again, this was not just any bookstore. This was the bookstore of the son-in-law of the royal secretary. If you can't trust the son-in-law of the royal secretary, who can you trust? And that arrangement turned out to be useful uh, for what Henry Knox really wanted to do. On January 3rd, 1775, Josiah Quincy Sr. of Braintree wrote to his son with sensitive news. Mr. W. brings intelligence from Boston that one of the Navy officers meeting with a land officer at K-X's shop, which is obviously Knox's shop, Officer K-X's stop, told him that on board all the ships their men were grown easy, so uneasy and tumultuous that it was with great difficulty they could govern them. Upon which the land officer observed that the uneasiness among the sailors was as full as great, if not greater, than among the seamen. So Quincy was sending sensitive information about the morale of the British fighting men based on information that somebody had overheard at K-X's shop. <laughs> So probably, Knox's bookstore, and probably Knox himself, was in fact a conduit of sensitive information for the Whigs. But it was useful because uh, nobody knew, I think, not that Knox was, quote unquote, an outspoken Whig. In fact, Knox could have been a source of extremely valuable information. In 1788-98, this man, Paul Revere, recalled, in the fall of 1774 and winter of 1775, I was upwards of one of upwards of 30 chiefly mechanics who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movement of the British soldiers. We held our meetings at the Green Dragon Tavern. We were so careful that our meetings should be kept secret that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that they would not discover any of our transactions. About November, when things started to grow serious, a gentleman who had connections with the Tory party but was a Whig at heart <laughs> acquainted me that our meetings were discovered and mentioned that identi the identical words that were spoken among us the night before. We were moved to another place, which we thought more secure. But here we found all our transactions were communicated to Governor Gage. This came to me through the then Secretary Flooker. He told it to the gentleman mentioned above. So who was that gentleman who had connections with the Tory party but was a Whig at heart? Who had connections particularly to Secretary Flooker? whose name still had to be kept secret 24 years later when Paul Revere wrote that down, several historians have concluded that the most likely suspect was Henry Knox. And of course, Thomas Flooker would be much more likely to speak freely in front of his son-in-law if he didn't think Knox was a Whig who would then go and tell Paul Revere what had happened. If he thought Knox was a loyalist or at least neutral and ripe for conversion and loyal to the family, then he, Flubber, would be more open. So I posit that nobody really had any idea up to the beginning of 1775 which way Knox was leaning in the politics of the time. But eventually, April 1775 happened, the war came, and Knox had to make a decision. Uh, we don't know 
how and when Knox got out of Boston. Uh, or, or, sorry, we have contradictory stories about how and when. Uh, biographies have been very unclear. I found the new information in, of all places, a mercantile magazine published in 1849. It contained a story, uh, an obituary of a descendant of Joseph Pierce. And you remember the name Joseph Pierce. He was the captain of the Boston, Brit British Gren of the Boston Grenadiers, the company that Knox co-founded. So they had worked closely together for years. And the Pierce family preserved this tradition. Knox had some difficulty in escaping from Boston, but he was enabled to do so through a permit obtained by Mr. Pierce for a chance to pass the lines at Boston Neck. As he took leave of the future general, the latter remarked, My sword blade is thrust through the cushions on which we sit, and Lucy has the hilt in her pocket. <laughs> and this was later retold so that somehow the sword is sewn into Lucy's dress. <laughs> but in fact, she only had the hilt, and the blade was in their cushion. When did that happen? Well, on May 14, 1775, the Boston minister Samuel Cooper wrote in his diary, we dined at Mr. Emerson's in Concord with Mr. Knox and wife of Boston. So it appears that the Knoxes were out of Boston and heading west by May 14th. And by early June, we know that Lucy was in Worcester and Henry was in Roxbury. Because he had made his decision. He was still not officially with the Massachusetts Army in terms of having a, a, an official rank or position. But he was a gentleman volunteer meaning he was helping out. And a big part of that label was gentlemen. <coughs> Henry was seen and saw himself as officer's material. He could have been enlisted as a private any time, but he was sort of holding out for an opening to become an officer. The provincial army had already been organized and there just weren't uh, open slots. Specifically, Knox was, uh, Henry Knox was down here in Roxbury, helping design, uh, to design a big fort. This was at the bottom of what is called the Boston Neck, which is this narrow strip of land that was all that connected Boston to the rest of Massachusetts at the time. And if you wanted to keep the British Army bottled up in Boston, you had to make sure they were, wouldn't march down that neck. And you did it by going to the hill in Roxbury and pointing your cannon, because they had cannon, remember? You pointing your cannon right down that neck. Early on the morning of July 6th, Henry wrote to Lucy in Worcester. He's all excited. He was living in Captain Lemuel Childs' house in Roxbury, and the previous night, day, he was excited to report his work had caught the eyes of two very important men. General George Washington, the newly arrived commander-in-chief of the army, and General Charles Lee, the new third in command, an Englishman with extensive military experience, very highly respected. Henry wrote, Yesterday, as I was going to Cambridge, I met the generals who begged me to return to Roxbury again, which I did. When they had viewed the works, they expressed the greatest pleasure and surprise at their situation and apparent utility, to say nothing of the plan, which did not escape their praise. So here he was. He had finally gotten the attention of the big guys. <laughs> On August 8th, General Washington invited General Henry Knox to dine here at his headquarters in Cambridge. On September 25th, Lucy Knox was invited to dine at headquarters as well. And this was the beginning of a mentor-protege relationship with Washington that lasted 20 years. And remember, at this point, Henry Knox wasn't even in the army. But Washington, having arrived, inspected the lines, talked with the officers, uh, talked, uh, uh, he had, was looking to shake up the artillery regiment. As I said before, the Massachusetts government had appointed a man named Richard Gridley to command it. Uh, this is a map that Richard Gridley drew of the fortress at Lu Fort Lewisburg in 1745. He was on that campaign. He was, in fact, some people credited him with winning that campaign by launching a shell into the British powder magazine. He had also served in the French and Indian War. He had received a pension from the British <coughs> Army of half pay recognizing him as uh, the equivalent of a regular officer. He was 20 years older than Washington, which meant he was 40 years older than Knox. But he was no longer up to the job. During the Battle of Bunker Hill, Colonel Gridley had behaved bravely, but the fortifications he had laid out were mediocre, 
and he had been wounded in the fighting. So after that battle, he had to stay home in Stoughton for several weeks or months to recover, and he would send orders to the front line through his son Scarborough, a major, who he had insisted that the Massachusetts government make Scarborough a major if they wanted him as colonel. Uh, Scarborough Ridley shows up on this uh, print of Bunker Hill. Here he is. Here's the battle. Here he is. Uh, he's in fact, up here, it's listening to him, I think it is, as broke officer. Because broke meaning he was cashier, he was court martial, he was kicked out. Because he was supposed to go into the battle, and he never went into the battle. Uh, he truly disgraced himself. And that fall, one Massachusetts general, John Thomas, confidentially told John Adams, uh, Colonel Ridley, I'm so, so famed, I think falls much short of my expectations and appears to me to be superannuated. And in September, uh, Scarborough Ridley was kicked out. Washington wrote to the governor of Connecticut about needing military engineers better than they had. He, lament, he lamented, how exceedingly deficient the army is of gentlemen skilled in that branch of business, and that most of the works which have been thrown up for our de the defense of our several encampments have been planned by a few principal officers of the army, i.e. not engineers, regular officers, assisted by Mr. Knox, a gentleman of Worcester. And it's possible, I think, there's another reason that people respected Knox, in addition for that fort at Roxbury and for uh, LDF, the unspoken reason which probably had gotten to uh, Washington, that they knew, people knew that Knox had been a conduit for intelligence before the war. People knew that Knox had given up a great deal by betraying, or at least leaving, his loyalist family and coming out to join the Patriots. So uh, we have this growing um, relationship with Washington. We have this need for uh, a new artillery commander. On October 23rd, General Washington presided over a conference at headquarters, and he brought up two points relating to the artillery personnel. One, very unhappy disputes prevailed in the artil regiment of artillery. Colonel Bridley has become very obnoxious to that corps, and the general is informed that he will prove a destruction of the regiment if continued therein. What is to be done in this case? And the answer that the council came up with was agreed that as all officers must be approved by the general, if it shall appear that in forming the new army that the difference is irreconcilable, Colonel Gridley be dismissed in some honorable way. Second problem, engineers are also much wanted. Where can they be got? Answer, agreed to recommend to the Congress Henry Knox, Esquire, and Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Putnam, who have the skill in this branch as assistant engineers with suitable pay and rank as lieutenant colonels. So, at the age of 25, Henry Knox was going to jump from being a gentleman volunteer to a lieutenant colonel and assistant engineer, and Rufus Putnam would be his uh, the equivalent, and Knox turned down that offer. He didn't think the rank was high enough, as he explained Ooh. to John Adams. Well. <laughs> a number of the generals, he said, desired me to act as engineer and said that when the delegates from the Continental Congress came here, the matter should be settled myself as chief engineer with the rank and pay of colonel. <coughs> of the three Continental Congress delegates who came to this house to discuss this with Washington, however, only one, Benjamin Franklin, supported that plan and not felt <laughs> disrespected. As all honor is comparative, I humbly hope that I have as good pretensions to the rank of colonel as many now in the service, the declining to confer which by the delegates not a little surprised me. If your respectable body should not incline to give me the rank and pay of colonel, I must beg to decline it, not but I will do every service in my power as a volunteer. But Washington knew what a man he wanted, and on, to, on November 8th, he threw the weight of the military establishment behind the idea of appointing Knox as the new artillery commander. He wrote to the Congress, the Council of Officers are unanimously of opinion that the command of the artillery should no longer continue in Colonel Gridley, and knowing no person better qualified to supply his place or whose appointment will give more general satisfaction, have taken the liberty of recommending Henry Knox Esquire to the consideration of the Congress. And nine days later, the Congress acted on that consideration, 
Not, Washington had already given Knox orders for his first mission. On November 16th, Washington told Knox, you are to proceed in the most expeditious manner to New York. There apply to the president of the, of the provincial congress of that colony for permission to take their cannon. You must go to Major General Philip Schuyler at Albany and get the remainder of from Ticonderoga, Crown Point, or St. John's. If it should be necessary from Quebec, if in our hands. The want of them is so great that no trouble or expense may be, must be spared to obtain them. Now this was a heavy mission. It required political skill to deal with the New York legislature and with this man, General Schuyler, and Knox was being asked to undertake this without an official commission yet, and he was still only in his mid-twenties. <laughs> and it also required technical knowledge to pick out the useful bits of art uh, artillery. And it required the logistical talent to transport those heavy guns across the sparsely settled and sometimes mountainous landscape. Now we often talk about Knox bringing cannon from Fort Ticonderoga. And that site was greatly restored in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It's a wonderful museum. It's got vibrant programs. It's very visible. It gets all the press. Meanwhile, Crown Point, which is also in the orders, is I think it's a very picturesque ruin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it a lot. But we know from the papers of General Schuyler and Colonel Knox that there were cannon at both spots, as well as at Fort George and some landings on Lake George. And it doesn't seem possible to sort out which cannon came from where. No one site had all the guns that Knox needed. Colonel Knox went up there. He chose 59 pieces of artillery, including 43 cannon and 16 mortars of different sorts. He also packed up one barrel of flints and 23 boxes of lead. We don't have any pictures of Knox's train of artillery made in 1776. We have a lot of pictures that artists made in the late 1800s and later. Lots and lots of pictures. <laughs> and most of those pictures show ox teams show it pulling the cannon on sleds. Even the Viewmaster slide shows ox teams. <laughs> And indeed, in December, ox teams pulled the sleds from the fort of Ticonderoga to the land, north landing of Lake George. So, up here, to Fort George, to Lake George. <coughs> then the, the guns were floated down the lake. But then, General Schuyler wasn't able to hire teams, oxen teams, on good terms. Instead, he sent out his wagon master and other people to all parts of the country to immediately send up their sleighs with horses. So for most of the journey, horses did the pulp. Knox added two teams of oxen to drag the heaviest cannon over the Berkshires when they started going uh, along this route east. So uh, two teams, four cannon, only on the heaviest. Uh, but by January 13th, he went back to horses, writing, after they get down the next hill, they will be able to travel much farther than the oxen. So we have all these pictures of oxen, but really, we should be uh, crediting the horses. Another thing we see in those pictures is snow. Lots and lots of snow. Part of the story of Knox's journey is that the rough winter weather, the cold and the snow, made his journey even harder and therefore even more impressive. But winter was when New Englanders moved heavy objects, like logs and masts and your wagon full of all your crops into town. It was easier to move on roads that were hard frozen or covered with slick ice. Uh, and so, in a way, by doing this mission in the winter, they were doing it intelligently. They were doing it at the right time. On uh, December 5th, Knox told uh, Washington, the conveyance from hence will depend entirely on the sledding. He was up here at this time. If that is good, they shall immediately move forward. Without sledding, the roads are so much gully that it will be impossible to move a step. And snow finally came around Christmas time, an exceeding fine snow, Knox reported. But now, and there's, this is one moment when there was too much snow at once. The next day, Knox wrote about traveling ahead by foot. We got a sleigh to go to Albany, but the roads not being broken prevented our getting further than about nine miles above Albany. 
and the horses tired and refused to go any further. I was then obliged to undertake a very fatiguing march of about two miles in snow three feet deep through the woods, there being no beaten path. So here, this was, you know, I wouldn't want to do this. It was two feet of snow, trying to get through the woods. But, uh, he, and he described himself as almost perished with the cold, but he wanted cold. Because cold would mean that the Hudson River would be frozen. <laughs> and he could get across uh, on the sleds, on the ice. In early January 1776, he was actually employed in cutting holes in the different crossing places places in the river in order to strengthen the ice. So you cut a little hole, you get the, let the water come up onto the ice in a thin uh, layer so it freezes, you get a bit more, and you build up the ice so it's thicker. So again, he wanted snow, he wanted ice. On January 4th, a cannon fell through the ice into the river at Half Moon Ferry. The next day, Knox complained to Washington from Albany, a cruel thaw hinders our from crossing the Hudson River. The first severe night will make the ice on the river sufficiently strong. Till that happens, the cannons and mortars must remain where they are, on the far side. Knox started off again on January 7th, but a bigger gun fell on the river. But this time, he was able to get the cannon out of the river, or, owing to the assistance of the good people the city of Albany gave, in return for which we christened her the Albany. <laughs> Four days later, he found the lead team stopped in Blandford, Massachusetts. Uh, the, team, the Teamsters refused going any further on account that there was no snow beyond five or six miles further. So once again, he was running into the problem that there wasn't enough snow. <laughs> the weather wasn't bad enough. Uh, I mentioned the cannon lost in the river. About 1853, an iron six-pounder with a royal monogram was dredged out of the Mohawk River. And there was an election dispute, and it was thrown back in the river, and it pulled back out in 1907, and then it was donated to a World War I scrap iron drive. It was actually cut in pieces before the staff of Fort Ticonderoga arrived there and grabbed it and had it put back together. And they were convinced that this was one of the cannons. This was the, the one cannon that had fallen into the river and not gotten out again. And now it is on display up at Fort Ticonderoga with this story. <laughs> Somehow, in between 1776 and now, it has shrunk from an 18-pounder to a 6-pounder. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not convinced that that, that, that the museum label is accurate, but it's a good story. Uh, yet another, that we often will celebrate January 24th as the day that Knox finally got his way back here to Cambridge and delivered the cannon here in Cambridge. Knox was keeping a diary for most of his journey, but he stopped keeping it on January 11th for some reason. So we don't actually know what he was doing or where he was after January 11th. We do have a good clue about when he arrived back in Cambridge because General William Heath's memoirs, based on his wartime diary, state that on January 18th, Colonel Knox of the artillery came to camp. He brought from Ticonderoga a fine train of artillery which had been taken from the British, both mortars and cannon, and which were ordered to be stopped at Framingham. So it seemed likely that Knox had gone ahead of his guns to Cambridge to confer with General Washington. Probably his brother William and other subordinates stayed back uh, to look after the guns. So Knox arrived on the 18th, the fine train of artillery was all still back in Framingham on the 26th when John Adams saw it there. So why do authors say that Knox reached Cambridge on January 24th? That appears to have been a mistake by Knox's first biographer in 1873, and it's simply been repeated and repeated. <laughs> when Knox did get here, his official commission as colonel of uh, the artillery regiment was waiting for him. And we can see exactly when he took command of that unit in an orderly book, or uh, uh, a notebook where people wrote down the orders at the Anderson House Library of the Society of the Cincinnati in Washington, D.C. On January 28th, there's a long spell, very little activity recorded in the artillery regiment. And then suddenly, on that day, January 28th, the book starts to fill with these long orders from Colonel Knox. So that's when he really became the colonel of the artillery regiment. I think that he went ahead of his guns to meet with Washington on January 18th, went back to collect the guns in Framingham, and 
Uh, then, uh, once he brought them forward, took command. Uh, incidentally, on January 22nd, uh, in this house, the Continental Army password was set, or one of the Continental Army passwords was set to be Framingham. So, General Washington was thinking about Framingham. Uh, another aspect of that, what I think of the myth, is that Knox delivered his cannon here. And we should think about whether that was true, whether that was even the destination, because if we look at this map of the roads in Massachusetts, the road forks in Marlboro, and the North Fork leads on through Concord, Lexington, and into Cambridge, and the South Fork leads to Framingham. So by parking the cannon in Framingham, which we know Knox did, he was actually making the trip to Cambridge longer. I'm not sure why Knox did that. It's possible that he was actually aiming to deliver the cannon along this road to Roxbury, which is the place he knew, which is the place where, uh, facing the neck into Boston, it was closest to Dorchester, if he already had that in mind. He had worked on that big fort there. Uh, it's possible that Framingham was a good place to fit up the cannon, because he was basically bringing back these metal tubes, and to make them work, you needed them on carriages, and you needed all the, uh, the rammers and the worms and the other things that go to make a cannon work. And it, it appears that Knox's heavy cannon remained in Framingham for a month or so, because it wasn't until February 26th that a Boston official named Ezekiel Price wrote in his diary, it is said that the heavy cannon which were left at Framingham are brought down to Cambridge. The mortars are fixed in their new beds. The fort at Leechmere's Point nearly f finished. Fascines going constantly to Dorchester and everything getting readiness in to make a push by our army. So that was February 26th, and that was indeed the moment when uh, the Americans were about ready to make their final push against the British. And everyone, a lot of books say, the cannon that Knox brought were put up on Dorchester Heights. And indeed, uh, the push that uh, Price talked about was focused on that position, the Dorchester Peninsula. It was also called the Neck. Uh, we know that there were high points, uh, that, that these high points on the peninsula are, are Dorchester Heights. Cannon in that position, big cannon, could threaten British ships in the harbor which made it a very good position to hold. And on February 11th, Washington, Knox, and others went out to examine that position. Based on a brainstorm from Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Putnam, the Continental Engineers prefabricated pieces of a fortification for those heights. And Knox was involved in the planning and logistics for that operation. An artillerist named Solomon Nash stated in his journal, we carried six 12-pounders on the Dorchester Heights. Back in October, Colonel Ridley had counted only two 12-pounders in the Continental Artillery. So at least four of the 12-pounders that went up onto the heights had to have come from Lake Champlain. So yes, Knox did bring some cannon back that went up onto Dorchester Heights. But there were other cannon and mortars deployed in many other places. At Leachmere's Point in East Cambridge, at Cobble Hill, uh, down here at Lamb's Dam in Roxbury. The plan that they had come up with depended on firing lots of shots into Boston in early March. That artillery fact, uh, fire distracted the British defenders and muffled the sounds of moving all the equipment along the road onto Dorchester Heights on the night of March 4th. And thus, on March 5th, the British commanders discovered that the Americans had built this prefab fortification up on the high point here, and it was strong enough that they could be digging in without fear of being attacked. And the British knew that the ships that they uh, in the harbor, which were both their supply lines and their escape route, were in danger. Many authors say that the cannon on Dorchester Heights drove the British to leave. And in a way that's true, within two weeks of seeing guns up there, the British evacuated Boston. But in another way, it's a bit of an exaggeration because the British uh, military commander, General William Howe, back in July, he had started to say, we've got to get out of here. There's no reason, there's no military reason to stay around in Boston. We cannot conquer New England from here. Uh, these people are religious zealots. They'll never be conquered. We, we should go somewhere else and uh, reconquer America from there. Uh, 
that he had told his superiors in London that. They had to, it took weeks to get the message across to London. It took a couple weeks for them to discuss it and consider it. It took weeks to, for them to send back the message. By the time he got the okay for this move, it was too late in the season for him to collect enough ships to make a, an efficient and safe uh, withdrawal. So he had decided to stay in Boston over the winter only because it was practical, but his, still, his strategic goal was still to get out of there. All that time, George Washington was in this house worrying that the British would come and counterattack his lines. He was worrying that the <clears throat> Congress wanted him to attack Boston and drive British, the British away, and he couldn't do it. He kept coming up with this, these bold, possibly reckless attack plans. But all the British really needed to leave was this nudge. They didn't need an all-out attack. And Her Colonel Knox and the cannon from Lake Champlain provided that nudge. And so in that way, that's reality. I, it, it, they were important in how the siege ended up. But it was a complicated reality, and I hope that I've uh, talked about, uh, entertained, and uh, provoked your thoughts with uh, what was mythical, what we just don't know, and what uh, is complicated about Henry Knox's rise to become Colonel of Artillery. Thank you. Um, there, uh, the question of gunpowder, uh, there are moments during the siege of Boston when uh, gunpowder is at a real crisis for the Continental Army, uh, especially in early August in this house where um, the, uh, the um, Massachusetts officials, including Elbridge Gerry, uh, who went out to, uh, uh, to Framingham with John Adams, uh, he came to Washington and he said, uh, but, sir, you, you remember the report we gave you of how much gunpowder Massachusetts had collected at the beginning of the war. We haven't actually been subtracting the amount that we've used. <laughs> <laughs> so that report is no longer uh, operative. And Washington is said to have then not spoken a word for half an hour. <laughs> uh, but there were secret efforts. There, they weren't so secret then because there are letters going out everywhere that day and the next day saying, God, send us gunpowder to all the other uh, organizations, all the other uh, uh, colonies. Um, but really they had collected enough gunpowder to have an efficient or a, an effective force in that final firing. And that, that early stretch in uh, early March 1776 was, uh, by American standards, uh, quite effective in terms of setting in shells and cannonballs. So they had enough gunpowder to make them useful then. But it took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. And it was really an international effort because they were smuggling it in from uh, mostly Caribbean islands uh, owned by the French, Spanish, Dutch, uh, other empires. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about Knox's long-term relationship with Washington mm -hmm. and what it was after the war. Because I read the book also on Lafayette. And it seems, based on what you just said, Washington had a number of these then? Washington, yes, he, he had a number of protégés. Uh, uh, Knox, Lafayette, Hamilton, Madison. Um, Washington at this point was in his uh, mid-40s. All these other uh, uh, men were in their early 20s. Uh, so it was a father-son relationship in many cases. Washington didn't quite get along so much with older men, uh, like Colonel Gridley. Um, and uh, so they, they worked very well together, most of these pairings. At some point or other, there were blow-ups. And for Hamilton, the blow-up, there was a blow-up during the war, uh, and then uh, later Lafayette, he never really had that sort of break, in part because he, he went back to France. For Knox, he worked closely with Washington through the Confederation period, it was his letters to Washington about the Shays Rebellion out in Western Massachusetts that convinced Washington that he should uh, become part of the Constitutional Convention. He was Secretary of War under both the Continental Congress and then under Washington for a number of years. Um, they're, they're, they finally had a little, little bit of a rupture when Washington was uh, called out of retirement to um, 
be in charge of the army during the quasi-war with the French, and Washington chose as his second in command the man who would do the real work of the administration, Hamilton. And Knox, who had been Secretary of War, did not feel good about that. And that was their, the, the only time, really, that they had a break. Yes, sir? Uh, what was the relationship uh, between Knox and his father-in-law after the war? <laughs> a very good question. Uh, Lucy Knox, Lucy Plucker Knox, uh, never saw or heard from her family again. <laughs> On the other hand, Lucy's mother, uh, who was a Waldo, inherited and passed down to her a great deal of land in Maine. And so that is why the Knoxes moved up to Maine and settled there after the uh, war and uh, owned, they, they were trying to be big proprietors. Uh, which, yes, Maine was then part of Massachusetts. Um, and they tried to be the, you know, the, the grand landlord who would bring in tenant farmers and uh, collect from them. Uh, so in one way, the Knoxes' fortune in the rest of their life was uh, based on Lucy's inheritance, and in another way, they had a very bad rift with the Fluckers. Yes? What about Knox's family? Knox, uh, Knox's father uh, went to sea and disappeared when he was a young man. Uh, his uh, older brothers uh, did the same. Uh, his mother, I forget when his mother died, but it basically he was uh, had to be the head of the family very early on, and he was very close to his younger brother William, but that was practically the only family he had. William, it turned out, uh, had what I think is quite likely bipolar disorder, and later ended up in an insane asylum because he was uh, so uh, disordered, so uh, unable to take care of himself as the in depression. But during during this this time, William was Henry's right hand man on the trip out to Fort Ticonderoga. Where did the British go? Where did the British go? They went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, most of them. Uh, and then from Halifax, General Howe was able to organize. Once also uh, the news convinced London that this was very serious. And so they, London and Howe, uh, um, combined to plan this huge reinvasion of America starting. Uh, in July 1776 through New York. Yes, sir. What did the British do militarily to try and drive the, uh, I mean, to try and uh, you know, take out the fortifications on Dorchester Heights between March 5th and March 17th? Did they do much? No. They uh, they, they, on March 5th, uh, General House sort of started to do things. He sort of started to order an attack, and they were got boats, and then there was a pretty big storm, and some of the boats were blown on to a uh, uh, Governor's Island in the harbor, and over the hours, Howe sort of realized, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not going to work. Uh, every hour that goes by, they're getting stronger. They're, they're digging in more. They've got more equipment up there. I'm not, I want to leave anyway. Uh, and he literally says something like, I, I only thought of doing this for the honor of the man. <coughs> and so there was no counterattack. Um, they very quickly started to move, uh, well, I would, uh, with, with due speed, they started to move. They started to move people onto the ships. They started to move equipment. They started to destroy uh, uh, things, uh, fortifications and equipment and so on. And uh, finally, by the 17th, they were ready to leave. Yes, sir. And the, and the British weren't at all wise to this whole uh, long uh, you know, transit of, of of cannon from uh, from Fort Yeah, from yeah. Um, they had uh, well. There are two things. One is that the countryside of New England was extremely radicalized at this point. That there were not many uh, loyalists out there, and uh, those few that there were out there. Well, what that could they do in order to get this information to uh, General Howe? They would have had to cross the line. And so it looks like uh, it is possible that the secrecy of the last few days or last couple of weeks of Knox's journey were based on the idea that, okay, we can't let, uh, let the news out. 
But uh, in coming down through New York and in Western Massachusetts, they were very open about what they were doing. They were, you know, showing off the guns. They were uh, doing firing demonstrations. On. There was no fear that they were having to do this all secretly. So I don't think I there there was no there's no indication in the British papers that they knew that this was happening. Or perhaps the British were just resigned to the fact that they were going to leave anyway. And yeah, I mean, they, they, they didn't care. at this point, they didn't have spies out there. Uh, they were also, uh, there was a lot more attention being paid to what was happening up in Quebec, mm -hmm. where, where the Americans had uh, uh, besieged the city um, on the, at the very end of 1775 and then lost and were being gradually driven back down by the, the small British forces and smallpox. And so <laughs> there were other things to worry about. Uh, that was part of it. Yes? Uh, what, what happened to the cannon after the British left Boston? In early, uh, in late March and early April, there are uh, lots of orders to, uh, from Washington to Knox to get the cannon and move them down to New York because everyone expected that the British would come back and counterattack at New York. It took them several months to do so, but uh, the Americans were worried that they would do so very quickly without even going to Halifax. They just sweeped down to New York. And uh, so they needed to get as many guns there as possible. And there are even there's a, a moment uh, I talk about um, in my book where uh, uh, Paul Revere and a couple of his colleagues in, for the Boston Town Meeting come out here, probably, and ask General Washington, you know those four cannon that were stolen from our armories and taken out to Concord, can we have them back? Uh, and like, <laughs> you don't ask for a general, a general to give you back cannon in the middle of the war. <laughs> and he didn't give them back. He was, they were probably already gone with Henry Knox uh, down to New York. Do we know if, if, if Fort George and Fort Ticonderoga on Crown Point were occupied by British troops of any, of any sort at that, that moment? Were they just um, the school, somebody folks on duty? And what was the record about their side of the story? Back in May. Uh, when General, uh, when Colonel Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen and Seth Warner and the Green Mountain Boys were starting to sweep up that side of the, the lake, uh, <coughs> there were tr British troops in Fort Ticonderoga. Um, they had no idea what was going on. The news of what had happened at Lexington and Concord had not reached them. So it was pretty easy for uh, Ethan Allen to conquer Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, he then, um, uh, I think, um, and, and Crown Point, I think, was not very well manned. Uh, Ethan Allen then decided to go and attack Montreal, and this went worked out very well for Montreal. <coughs> Ethan Allen was captured and spent the next two years uh, in British custody. Um, so uh, by that point, news had reached the British in the region. But at the beginning, uh, it was pretty lightly manned, and uh, they didn't have enough intelligence to be prepared. Yeah. Was Washington doing covert operations at this point with spies? And was this part of the secrecy? He, he, he was trying to uh, spy on the British in Boston. He was also worried about spies, uh, British uh, spies working for the British uh, elsewhere in the colonies. Um, he, and in October of 1775, he got the great shock that the man he had in charge of his medical department, or the man that the Continental Congress had put in charge of his medical department, was spying for the British. So yes, he was very aware of spies at that point. And in fact, that moment in October 1775, that's when he stops, it appears, the, 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 the number of paper, it, the, there are papers from early uh, in Gen Washington's arrival, July, August, September, where he talks about intelligence. And then in October, suddenly, he has, he's much more circumspect. And because that's when he learns that, oh, this is a two-way street. They're also buying on me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you think that was the, the turning point where he decided to make it part of his... I think he had all... I mean, even before he came to this house in early July, he had paid a man to go into Boston to spy on the British. So it was always... Uh, what we call espionage was always part of his thinking as a military commander. Um, I, I'm not sure he really grasped the, the full need for secrecy because he had things like his military secretary writing out letters uh, with much more information than the officer needed and saying, and you must burn this letter and then the officer wouldn't burn the letter, which is how we know about this at all. <laughs> yes, yes. And I call in this head uh, the strategic advantage of these weapons up where they couldn't be uh, hit by the British. 
did they have the technical ability to fire those weapons? And why didn't they take advantage of that strategic opportunity to destroy at least some number of the ships? You know, why leave the British alone? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. They did have some pretty good uh, gunners. Um, and they did do a bit of damage in Boston, but actually not that, not that many people died in Boston. Uh, uh, there are some buildings that were hit. Uh, the, what was then the Brattle Street Church had a cannonball in its facade for the next several decades. Um, I think they did not, I mean, they never had as many, as, as much gunpowder, as much ammunition as the British had. So they had to be choosy. Um, I'm not sure how successful they would have been, therefore, at getting the ships, hitting the ships. But there's also a certain gentlemanly agreement. Uh, there's a moment when, when General Howe goes to the selectmen of Boston, and the selectmen of Boston send a letter out to the uh, officer in charge at Roxbury and is sent over to Washington saying that General Howe is ready to leave if you don't try to you know, set, uh, attack. And Washington reads this, and he sees that he's not addressed as General Washington, and it's not an official uh, communication from General Howe. And so he sends back a letter saying that, you know, this, this is not official, therefore, I have read it, but I take no notice of it. <laughs> and yet, he said he had read it. <laughs> so he was being tacit. Every, both sides recognize that, okay, we have made, the communication has taken place. And indeed, that's how it worked out, that the Americans did not attempt to attack uh, the British positions in, uh, in a big way, and the British did proceed to leave. Was that letter after March 5th, or would it have been before that? That was, that was after March 5th. That was between March 5th and March 10th, I think, because there was, a, there was a moment when Washington decided that the British were not moving fast enough, and he had the, uh, 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 the, the, the spot on the Dorchester Peninsula closest to the city, he had that fortified and put cannons there uh, in order to speed them up. Um, but that that worked. So they did speed up, they did leave. You had a big storm in there too, right? Well, there's a the big storm on the, on the 5th over the 6th, and it was some, I think the storm is somewhat exaggerated in some of the sources, because, you know, this is a Puritan, post-Puritan community, and they love the idea that Providence was on our side and was going to destroy the British counterattack with a great storm. And really, I mean, there, it was, yeah, there was a storm, there were ships blown, or boats uh, blown on shore on Governor's Island, but it wasn't, uh, you know, <laughs> the wrath of God coming down. Do they interest enough? Uh, do we have cannon that can be traced to Knox? We have a lot of cannon that are said to be traced to Knox. <laughs> I have found in looking, trying to look for these four stolen cannon, uh, I've, I've found two of them. Uh, but they're, they're little, and Knox didn't have much to do with them until after the war. But uh, in looking at them, I found very little evidence that they weren't keeping track of where things were. You, these inventories of cannon do not say, and this one is marked this way, and this one is marked that way, so that we can trace them. So there are cannon in <coughs> monuments and at parks that are said, you know, these are cannon that now General Henry Knox brought back from Fort Ticonderoga. <laughs> Maybe they are. I, <laughs> I couldn't say no, but I, I don't know what the evidence would be for that. What are those on the common? Um, those might be part of it. And sometimes they are said to be uh, every Knox's cannon. Sometimes there's just a lot of cannon around in this town. That's all I can say. Uh, and a, an old uh, cast iron cannon cannot be used for much else. Once, it's, once people lose confidence that it's not going to blow up on them, you can't melt it down the way you can with the brass. Uh, so there were two things that they used old cast iron cannon for. One was ship's ballast which is probably why this one ended up in the Mohawk River where it was fished out and they decided to send your Uh And the other is monuments. So <laughs> maybe they're not Henry uh, Knox Cannon. I don't know. But they are, I know that they are sometimes said to be. Yes, sir. Oh, you mentioned that um, Howe and the British just needed a little bit of a nudge in early March. Is there any intelligence, any information that they might have had some sort of a plan uh, 
uh, the, 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 the town. They were starting to form a plan at, at that time as to what would come next. That, that yes, would how, to support that argument. How had already told the uh, British uh, government in London that really the, our best shot would be to go to New York, uh, take command of New York, split the colonies. Um, it, it 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 worked. Uh, they were able to take New York and hold it for the rest of the war. They weren't able to carry out the rest of the plan. Um, so yes, it's just that when you're in an empire, you have to go back to the bosses and figure it out, and uh, that just took time. And you think that that plan went back to uh, to London? Yes, that, that, that's, that's that's how we know. New York. That's how we know what Howe was thinking, and it took a while for Howe to convince General Gage, and then General Gage was recalled. Um, and meanwhile, over in London, there was a bit of a shuffle at the top of the uh, the ministry for the Secretary of State for the Colonies. So there were a lot of a lot of things that had to be put into place. This was also the time when the uh, government in London was uh, contracting with, negotiating with the pr British princes for some of, to use some of their troops, the so-called Hessians, which were part of the big army that came back into America. Uh, so this was um, there was a lot of things that had to be put together. When the British came back in July 1776 through September, they brought the largest expeditionary force, the largest amphibious assault force yet assembled in modern times. Uh, so they, they had a lot of uh, 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 balls to put in a row there. <laughs> yes? Um, there were several forts of which Fort Washington in Cambridge is still the I guess is the only one that's left. Mm -hmm. How did those work? Did they actually have artillery too, or were um, they mostly just staffed by Fort, Fort Washington, it survives because the Dana family, which has connections here with the Walter right. family, decided to, to preserve it at a time when there really wasn't a preservation ethos in American culture. Uh, people had, um, uh, had fought the war in order to be able to use their land as they wanted. And so they were plowing up the forts. They were plowing up all these uh, places if they could get to them, uh, or rebuilding on top of them, which is why you know, the, the Bunker Hill battlefield is just this one little spot with the monument on it, and everything else is built up. Um, it, there were fortifications all around Boston. Fort Washington was a very minor fortification. Right. If you look at it, it's, it's not close to Boston at all. Uh, it's also pretty small if, if you look at the, the, uh, the map uh, and try to find it. So at a certain point, I think that uh, Washington had men building fortifications just in case and to keep them busy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think that's where Fort Washington falls in. There were other positions like on Leachmere's Point which were closer to Boston and those were strategically set to be able to put cannon and mortar closer so that you can actually do damage in Boston. And those were also dangerous places to, to um, uh, you had to, um, they had to build causeways and other things to protect the men digging because the British could fire back <coughs> at them to there. Any other questions? No, real, real quickly, um, do you have a, um, a, an opinion on what the best book might be? that actually describes the siege of Boston. <laughs> well, that, one, that one goes up until yeah, know, April 18th. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so you're writing a really, uh, um, really great account. What book you want? Yes. Uh, well, Ellen French's book, The First Year of the American Revolution, is very good. It's also out of print. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's uh, on for news booksellers. Uh, it costs a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, online, you can find Richard Frothingham's History of the Siege, uh, which, for its time, was very good. It's uh, very much based on uh, Brit American sources, not very many British sources, uh, and it shows that bias. Um, <laughs> since then, a lot of the American histories have written about the Bunker Hill rather than the whole siege. Um, if yeah. Phil Brooks book, to, and, and it's part because we like this this narrative structure where it, you know, the action builds up and it's got all of a sudden, and, and the battle is like that. But 
uh, the way the siege actually works is you have this big battle and then it seems like it just piddles on for months and months and months and yet the battle has actually won the siege because the battle is what convinced Gage and Howe that there's no use sticking around here, we should leave. Um, I'm, this project, what I've been talking about, is uh, going to be my contribution eventually to the literature of the siege of Boston. Be great. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to be a full, uh, full story, but no, I have, uh, besides Frothingham and French, yeah. I have not, uh, I have seen other books on the siege, but I cannot really uh, recommend them at the same level. Okay, well thank you all.